hearty welcome to one and all to the unit on Sri Narayana Guru Crusade Against Casteism. Caste is a form of social stratification characterized by endogamy, hereditary transmission of a lifestyle which often includes an occupation, status in hierarchy and rules of customary social interaction and exclusion. Although caste systems exist in various regions, its paradigmatic ethnographic example is the division of Indian society into rigid social groups with roots in India's ancient history and persisting until today. The caste system is a subject of much scholarship by sociologists and anthropologists. The Indian caste system is sometimes used as an analogical basis for the study of caste-like social divisions. Let us take a look at the hierarchy of caste in India. The caste system has its origin in ancient India and it underwent transformations during the medieval, early modern and modern periods, especially during the times of the Mughal Empire and the British Raj. It consists of two different concepts, Varna and Jati, which may be regarded as different levels of analysis of this system. Varna literally means colour, but the Sanskrit root Vri also means to choose, to cover, to count, etc. The earliest reference to the occupational aspect of Chaturvarnya or the fourfold Varna order is found in the Purusha Sukta in Rigveda. From the primeval being, the Purusha, the four Varnas originated in the following manner. The Brahmin was his mouth, of both his arms was the Rajanya or the Kshatriya made. His thighs became the Vaishya, from his feet the Shudra was produced. The Dharma Shastras contain a detailed account of the Varna system. They refer to a fourfold division of society into Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishya and Shudras. There is also the lowest class of people who were ostracized for unrighteous and unethical conduct. Their social status as outcasts or untouchables put them outside the Varna system. They are addressed as Patita in Dharma texts. The Jati system follows a more complex and rigid hierarchy than the Varna order. Its Sanskrit root is Jan, which means to take birth. This indicates the immutability of one's caste identity determined by birth. It remained a closed social system in terms of strictly defined rules of endogamy, occupation and social and physical distance. This had been the source of the much despised social evils like untouchability. Indian society even today remains a complex web of numerous castes, tribes and religious communities. Each jati is assigned a traditional job function. The tribal and caste groups are conventionally endogamous units traditionally distributed over a restricted geographical range. Generally, the different caste populations arranged hierarchically constitute a complex village society. Each of the caste groups over a period of 1500 years had assumed striking differences in cultural traits like vocational skills, food habits, dress codes, languages and religious practices. The South Indian state of Kerala also had maintained the caste hierarchy with some variations of course only in the pattern of jati order but not in any one of the inhuman rules of caste discrimination. By the late 19th century, there were more than 500 castes in the small state of Kerala and the lower strata had to undergo all the bitter experiences of untouchability, unapproachability and even unseeability. When Swami Vivekananda visited Kerala in the latter half of the 19th century, he found it a lunatic asylum that made him remark, I quote, 
A in this country of yours, the very birthplace of Vedanta, our masses have been hypnotized for ages into that state. To touch them is pollution, to sit with them is pollution. Hopeless they are born, hopeless they must remain. And the result is that they have been sinking, sinking and have come to the last stage to which a human being can come. For what country is there in the world where man has to sleep with the cattle? If anybody is born of a low caste in our country, he is gone forever. There is no hope for him. Why? What a tyranny! Those thousands of brahmanas, what are they doing for the low, downtrodden masses of India? Don't touch them is a mental disease. Beware! All expansion is life. All contraction is death. All love is expansion. All selfishness is contraction. Love is therefore the only law of life." Unquote. It was into this hell of casteism that the boy who in due course became Sri Narayana Guru was born in a lower caste family in the year 1855 in a small village near Tiruvandapuram, the capital of Kerala. He belonged to the Irava community, the major and highest placed caste among the Avarnas. In spite of their lower social rank in the caste hierarchy, some of the Irava families had the occasional privilege to learn Sanskrit texts and to master the traditional medical system of Ayurveda. Enjoying this rare opportunity to access the classical sources of ancient wisdom, the brilliant boy could reach the heights of his inborn spiritual genius. This is evident for anyone who goes through his major philosophical works like Darshanamala and Atmobadesha Shadagam. The Bhagavad Gita says that whenever dharma is in peril, God incarnates himself to redeem the victims of a dharma and to restore order in society. Thus, living in the midst of the devastating effects of caste segregation and discrimination, Sri Narayana Guru took up the crusade against casteism and preached the sermon, one caste, one religion and one God for mankind. Let us now take a look at Sri Narayana Guru's analysis of caste. Sri Narayana Guru addressed the problem of caste by making a detailed analysis of the institution of caste. In the works like Jati Lakshanam and Jati Nirnayam, he presents a logical, scientific and biological analysis of caste by repudiating the Smriti justification of Jati hierarchy. In Jati Lakshanam, he says that Schools of Indian philosophy like Nyaya have logically characterized the class of animals based on the universal animalhood. Similarly, all human beings can only be classified in terms of the universal humanness. A caste identity that is imposed upon any individual solely on the basis of birth has no logical or scientific basis and hence caste is purely a human device. According to Guru, the entire human race belongs to one class that is the humanity and hence there is only one religion and one God. All human beings have the same origin and hence belong to one caste namely humanity. From this it follows that the Brahmin and the Paraya both are born to the same human race and so we cannot make any superior or inferior differentiation in terms of caste. The venerable sage Parashara was born to the Paraya woman Adya Shanti and the great Vedavyasa who is credited with the composition of the Brahma Sutras was born to the fisher woman Matsya Gandhi. Hence there is no doubt that the hierarchy created in the name of caste has neither a scientific nor a historical basis. What characterizes humanity as a caste? To this Sri Narayana Guru replies that the individuals that by mating can reproduce an offspring belong to one species or caste. This brings all human beings irrespective of all artificial distinctions into a single species. This is true of all beings in the animal kingdom. It was customary in those days to ask one's caste identity as people met each other. For Guru, 
it was quite an irrelevant question because the identity of a person as a human being is obvious by his or her very physical appearance. Further, a person's name, place and profession would be sufficient to reveal one's identity. Therefore, the wise will never seek to know the caste identity of a person. In this context, Sri Narayana Guru reminds us that we should never forget the fact that all apparent distinctions in this world arise from the same underlying undivided consciousness. Just as the waves and bubbles are never separate from the larger identity of the ocean, all the diverse appearances originate from, belong to and ultimately merge into that one absolute, the Brahman. Sri Narayana Guru's meditations on the Advaita philosophy of Adi Shankaracharya revealed to him a great truth that since the same divine spirit glows in all human beings, all humanity is one. This vision of the non-duality of the individual self and the divine self, that is the Jivatma and Paramatma, formed the philosophical ground of Guru's radical critique of casteism. Thus, he evolved a gospel of unity that inspired many to challenge the evils of caste discrimination and its consequent ideologies of domination, exploitation and oppression. The following verses from Jati Lakshanam clarify his perspective of caste. Punarnu perum ellam or inamam punarathadu inamalla inamam ingor inayarnadu kanmadam all that are born through the sexual union of the male and female belong to the same class or species. Others are not the same species. Those that court each other also belong to the same class. Oro inatinum meyum oro madiri ochayum manavum chuvayum chudum tanuvum nokum orkanam. Each class has its distinctive form, speech, scent, taste sight and body temperature, hot-blooded and cold-blooded and within them temperature differences. Tudarn oronilim vevvere adayalam irikkayal arinyi idunnu vevvere pirichu oronu mingunam. Since each class has its distinctive features, we are able to identify them as belonging to a particular group. Peruuru todili moonum poryum ayadu kelkuga aru niyannu kelkenda when you want to get acquainted with a person, ask for his name, native place and vocation or the job he does. There is no need to ask what caste he is. His body characteristics, speech and behaviour will tell you his caste or class, that is his level of cultural achievement. Inamar nudal tantande, inam edennu cholgayal, inam edennu kelkilla, ninavum kannumullavar. The physical features or characteristics of an animal tells to what class or species it belongs to. Therefore, with the power of perception and cognition, understand class and do not ask about class or caste. All men belong to one class, that is Homo sapiens. That a person belongs to the human species is evident when you see him. Then what is the need to ask about the caste or class that he belongs to? This explanation leads us to its corollary in the form of a message. Don't enquire about caste, don't tell about your caste, don't think in terms of caste. Poli chullun ni nam chullvad irivennu ni nekkayal, irivilli nam onnana poli chullerudarume. Some people are ashamed to reveal their caste or class, so they resort to telling a lie. When all men are considered as one caste, there is nothing to be ashamed to be a human. Hence, there is nothing wrong in being a member of a particular caste or class. No one should hide his class with a lie. Anum pennum verdirichu kanum vannam inatteyum kananam kurigondi mattan nam ariyendada. Just as you distinguish between the male and female by their physical characteristics, you can identify a person by the qualities inherent in him. This is the way to distinguish the class of a person. Let us now take a look at Sri Narayana Guru's crusade against casteism. 
The success of Guru as a philosopher and a social revolutionary lies in his relentless efforts to translate the practical potential of Vedanta Darshana for achieving the goal of human unity beyond all artificial divisions like caste, race and religion. Thus he preached practical Vedanta with the logical conclusion that there is only one caste that is humanity, one religion that is humanism and one God that is the universal spirit. This artificial and arbitrary division of society with its rules of enforced social ranking and untouchability is against this essence of Advaita philosophy. It was conceived and created to serve the interest of some dominant classes and is a proven insult to human dignity. With his realization of this truth, Guru proceeded to the Himalayan task of making the poor ignorant people realize the presence of the universal spirit within them. His aphorism, one caste, one religion and one God for man became the dynamic center for his radical actions to liberate the downtrodden castes and classes from the evils of the unnatural socio-economic order. Not only had the imposed segmentation from outside but also the complacency of these segmented people compelled them to remain within their self-created prisons. Hence, Guru insisted on the education of those ignorant masses as the primary means to their liberation. In those days, Hindu temples were the citadels of caste superiority and domination. There was strict prohibition of temple entry for the lower caste people. The poor souls of the untouchables had to wait patiently some 30 to 50 feet away from the tem temple premises with the hope that a glimpse of that prosperous deity would improve their lives. Even in this pathetic state, Guru saw in them the hidden desire for emancipation and progress but subdued and stifled by tradition. This dominant spirit, if awakened, will become the propelling force for their upward social mobility. They should derive the courage to shed the shackles of tradition from within themselves. As the first step to meet the shameless exploitation and the humiliation by their caste superiors, Guru decided to set up new temples which are open to all equally. Sri Narayana Guru made a calculated move in this direction. He consecrated a Shiva temple at Arivipuram, about 40 kilometers south of Tiruvandavaram, in the early morning hours of Shivaratri of 1888. It was an open challenge to the Brahmin priesthood and a Brahmin scholar instantly came forward to question the right of an Idava, the Guru's caste of the Avarna stratum was Idava, to install the idol of a deity. As Guru quipped, this is not a Brahmin Shiva, this is an Idava Shiva. The arrogant rivals remained dumbfounded. Guru's bold venture to install a Shiva idol at Arivipuram was the first stroke against the artificial wall created between human beings and God. To the downtrodden people, it was the assertion of the fundamental right to worship any deity they like. It was the first step towards their liberation from spiritual slavery and a real eye-opener to their right to equality and freedom. The message inscribed therein is, I quote, this is a model abode where all live in brotherhood without caste distinctions and religious rivalries." Unquote. Sri Narayana Guru continued to construct and consecrate as many as 60 temples throughout Kerala and in the neighboring states of Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and in Sri Lanka. They demonstrate Guru's vision in the messages like, I quote, one caste, one religion and one God for man." Unquote. Ask not, say not, think not caste. Whatever may be the religion, let man improve himself." Unquote. The final installation was a mirror at Kalavangodam near Chertalai in the Alapuda district of Kerala. When the Guru was invited for the consecration ceremony, the intention was not to install a mirror. 
the organizers had actually got a conventional idol ready for installation. When the Guru arrived at the place, a controversy was raging between two sections of devotees. Those claiming to be progressive, denouncing idol installation as a retrograde step and another group demanding installation of the conventional idol. Guru listened to the arguments from both sides but made no comment. Then, with his natural smile, he asked to fetch a good mirror. When it was brought, he inscribed on it the sign Om. Before anyone could think of debating, it was installed in the place of the deity. This Pranava Pradishta is the last installation by the Guru. These three stages of installations, the idol, the lamp and the mirror with the Om inscription, represent the progressive steps in our journey to spiritual perfection. Through the mirror installation, the Guru revealed to the masses his message. I quote, God is not somewhere up above, but is the innermost being of one's own self. Unquote. Sahodar Nayapan, 21st August 1889 to 6th of March 1968, was one of the outspoken followers of Sri Narayana Guru. He was a social reformer, thinker, rationalist, journalist and politician all rolled into one. At Charai, in 1917, Ayyappan organized a Mishra Bojanam, a grand feast of all castes sitting together under one roof. The feast was organized under the aegis of the Sahodara Sangam or the Brotherhood Association, an organization that Ayyappan himself had organized for the purpose of eradicating the evil of casteism. The feast was attended by about 200 people including so-called untouchable puleyas. This was opposed forcibly by conservative sections of society including Irava lords. For a while thereafter, his detractors sarcastically called him Pulayan a name which he took as an honor. From then on, Ayyappan came to be known as Sahodaran Ayyappan. On the 15th of May 1921, Sri Narayana Guru sent a message of support to Sahodara Sangam during their annual conference supporting inter-caste marriages and community fees. Guru's main thrust was on education. Temples were only a tool in his hands to bring the marginalized people out of their dejection and self-pity. This is evident from his declaration that money need not be spent any more in construction of large temples. He had understood that ignorance and poverty are the root cause of all social degeneration and backwardness. Mere worship in temples will not dispel these. Education which was denied to lower caste people for so many generations is the supreme remedy and the only means by which the weaker sections can be strengthened and liberated from backwardness. Education must be a tool to liberate them from superstitious traditions, a means for economic independence and a weapon to fight social injustice. Education should enable the people to integrate the opposing values of spiritual and temporal, traditional and contemporary. Hence, Guru emphasized that knowledge is God. Though he had started Sanskrit schools, he encouraged the learning of English as it was necessary for developing technology and industries. His famous slogan is, Freedom through education, strength through organization, economic independence through industries. On the social front, enthusiastic young followers of Guru like Dr. Palpu were trying to establish an organization to fulfill his vision of a united humanity. Following the advice of Swami Vekananda, he sought the spiritual leadership of Sri Narayana Guru to convert the temple association of Arivipuram into Sri Narayana Dharma Paripalana Yogam or the SNDP. To conclude, Sri Narayana Guru is not only a great social reformer of Kerala, but also one of the spiritual sources of Indian Renaissance. His philosophical position was obviously that of a Vedantin, but his approach to the essential teaching of Vedanta was unique. Guru regarded Advaita not just as a means to personal salvation, but more as a weapon in the crusade against casteism, 
which had been the perennial source of the miseries experienced by a large number of Indian populace. Hence, among the Vedantins, Sri Narayana Guru remains a karma yogi who had been concerned with the practical application of Advaita Darshana for the liberation of the downtrodden masses in India. Not only did the Guru wage a war against casteism, but he also inspired, motivated and directed several luminary disciples and thereby ensured that the work that he embarked upon continued and evolved into a mass movement against the evil of caste. As a philosopher, Guru was keen on transcending the interpretative limits of Vedanta to make it the metaphysical basis of human unity and ultimately of the oneness of the whole cosmos. Let me now introduce you to some assignments related to this topic. First is define caste. Distinguish between Varna and Jati. How does the Purusha Sukta explain the origin of the four Varnas? How did the caste system in Kerala differ from its counterparts in other states of Kerala? Give an account of untouchability and unseeability as it existed in Kerala. Give an account of the analysis of caste made by Sri Narayana Guru in Jati Lakshanam and Jati Nirnayam. What was the significance of the installation of the idol at Arivuppuram temple? One caste, one religion and one god for man explain the significance of this proclamation. Bring to light the efforts of Sahodar Nayipan for the eradication of caste. What were the two dimensions of education as conceived by Sri Narayana Guru? Now, I can suggest to you some excellent books that are connected to this particular topic. The first of which is The Works of Sri Narayana Guru with Complete Interpretation. This was authored by Professor G. Balakrishnan Nair and it was published by the State Institute of Language Publication in the year 2003. Another important work is the philosophy of Sri Narayana Guru produced by Professor S. Omana. This was published by Narayana Gurukulam Varkala in the year 1984. Another work also by Professor Omana is Sri Narayana Guru Jeevidavum Darshanavum published by the Kerala State Institute of Language Publication in the year 2013. Another important work is Narayana Guru a Social Educator this work was penned by Perera J. Gerald and it was published by RR Publishers in the year 1989. Another significant work is Sri Narayana Guru written by Sri M. K. Sanu published by the National Bookstall in the year 1999. A very important work in the series would be Sri Narayana Guru Vinde Samburna Kritikal written by Professor T. Baskaran, published by Madhurbhumi Publications, Kori Code. Another work is Sri Narayana Guru, authored by Murkot Kunyapa, published by National Book Trust in the year 2008. Another important work is the philosophy of Sri Narayana Guru, authored by Sri Muni Narayana Prasad. This was published by DK Print World, New Delhi in the year 2003. With this, we come to an end of this session entitled Sri Narayana Guru Crusade Against Casteism. Thank you.